Doctor Doctor Peterson, why is it you think all of these these um, these left wing radicals seem to fundamentally hate uh, uh, the the ideas that built the United States? Well, you know, I mean, it's the it's the story of Cain, right? Uh, you have uh, these, this je- jealousy, this deep, deeply uh, ingrained jealousy in their DNA. And uh, if, as they say in the, the film Tombstone, um, you know, you're, ang- you're angry at God for, for, for being. And I think we all feel that, but this is just the lashing out of children uh, who have not been f- properly developed in our society. And I, that was just impressive. I, thank you, thank you, oh. Doctor Peterson. <laughs> I'm, 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 oh no, he's crying. He's, he's crying. He's again. crying. He's crying. Oh, boy. Doctor oh, Peterson, God. it's okay. It's okay. It's okay, oh. Jordan Balthazar Peterson. Oh no, I'm sorry. To be clear, that was I was coming from a, a photograph from a Sports Illustrated. Um, oh, that's well, good. A, a woman that's I, I, I do find beautiful. Um, One from the 1970s when indeed, things were, yes, were when still ordered were properly. Correct. Yes. yes. <laughs> So I've been looking at my copy of Maps of Meaning, and mm. yeah, terrible uh, book. I apologize for writing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all the time Doctor Peterson you know, has for us today. Um, I'm Robert Evans. Let's go to the second portion of Behind the Bastards, where I introduce my co-hosts, Katie Stoll, Cody Johnston. Hello, hello, mm-hmm. co-host. How you guys doing? Eh? Mm-hmm. Fucking great. Yes, oh, got bumped right, from guest uh... to co-host. Look, you'll you'll always be my co-host, mm-hmm. even though. Mm-hmm. Our sh- our other show is paused while we wait for the litigation to finish. Um, oh God, yeah, no, we'll, yeah, any day, yeah. any day story. now, any day, any now. day yeah. now. I mean, they our deposed us all this it's week, so fine. Yeah. yeah, it's looking good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> it's good to have you back on. Good to be doing this again. And I thought I'm going to have some of my best friends. We're all going to sit down and talk. What better thing to chat about? than a massive decades-long sexual abuse scandal within America's largest Protestant denomination. Fuck you, man. God damn, you know us so well. <laughs> like, yeah, I'd love mm. to hop on the podcast with Robert again. That sounds like bullshit. fun. Mm. <laughs> um, it's that no, good I'm stuff. Here. Yeah. So today our bastard is the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, what do you guys know about the, 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 the SBC? <laughs> Uh, is it uh, is that phrase true? All all cops are Baptists. Is that yes? That is that is. It I mean, yeah. actually, broadly speaking, Broad, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if we generalize, some of them are Pentecostals, and those are the real scary ones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know much. I don't know much. I am the perfect mm. canvas for this story. I, I wish all cops were Anabaptists because mm. the Anabaptists <laughs> were actually pretty dope. But that's a story for another and day. That- um, that's a be a that also got work. massacred yeah. in a castle, but anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but anyway, I digress. This, yeah. The Southern Baptist, the Southern Baptist convention, we'll talk about what that means, but like the Southern Baptist convention is like the thing that organizes the Southern Baptist denomination. Essentially Southern Baptists are the largest Protestant denomination in the United States. Today, there's around 14 million of them, um, and there's like 46 or 47,000 uh, S- uh, SBC affiliated churches in the United States. So, real big um, and very con- very conservative. A lot of people will argue that like the Southern Baptists are kind of the heart of the conservative movement in the United States in a lot of ways. Um, and at the moment, as we speak, like literally the week that we're recording this, um, a bunch of fucked, uh, well, okay, the literal week that we're recording this, they had their annual Southern Baptist convention where they vote on a bunch of stuff, including like the dude who's going to be, we'll call him the president of the Southern Baptists. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, they vote on like resolutions and stuff. We'll talk about that at the end in part two, a little bit more how that went. Um, but yeah, the, the thing that was kind of one of the top stories about the Southern Baptists is both this kind of war between it's really not between left and right it's between like normal conservatives and absolute fascist maniacs right mm. like <laughs> oh yeah that classic um, tale yeah um, that classic, classic tale of like yeah. people who don't like taxes and people who want to do a genocide yes yeah. so that clash has been and this has been actually going on for years but the thing that has kind of um uh, sent a curveball in it is starting like a, a year or so ago, two years ago, something like that. The uh, a, a series of articles started being published um, by the Houston Chronicle um, about a massive sexual abuse scandal within the SBC. So we're going to talk about that a lot. Uh, <laughs> that's what we're Good. all we're going to be going into today. But, but um, okay. 
before we get into that, we need to do some history, right? Because while over the course of my lifetime uh, and y'all's lifetimes, the Southern Baptists have been a huge force for rigid, regressive, often vicious conservatism, they didn't start that way. The very hmm, first again, Baptist. Tale as old as time. Yeah, tale as like old as time, tale, right? right? <laughs> yeah. It is kind of weird how different um, this actually gets kicked off, though, is um, from where they are now. So the very first Baptist church uh, was founded in 1609 in Amsterdam uh, by an English dissenter named John Smythe. Um, now, John and his fellows, again, what a dissenter is, these are folks like, you know, you got that Church of England thing, right? Because you get that king. And there's like, he wants, you know, wants to fuck. There's other stuff than the he fucking wants to fuck? people. He, wa- he wanted to fuck. He wanted to fuck. Like he wanted to, well, he wanted marriages anyway, whatever. Right. He, wanted he wanted to do to, shit yeah. you couldn't do as a Catholic. There's other stuff going on. People always Which get angry. Well, it wasn't just about matter? that. This was going on too. And this was going on too. And <laughs> fuck you and your English history. I don't care. Um, anyway, you have these, you have this church of England get established, breaks away. Catholicism's illegal, all that good stuff. And then you have these like dissenters who are not Catholic, but also are not, don't want to don't like the idea of the Church of, of England and John Smythe particularly and his followers in Amsterdam. The thing they don't like is the idea of the religion being affiliated with the state government. They don't want a state religion. They think there should be sure. separation between church and state. Right. Wow. And I, we'll see about there, that. Yeah. There's yeah, is less about time. like. Yes. And I, again, this is not no. because of like this is less about personal liberty, I think, in their hearts than it is about like the state will fundamentally corrupt the faith. Um, yeah, which it's, it's, it well, sure does uh, seem yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> might've been yeah, right on the yeah. money there, John. Yeah. Um, now there's, a, there's some other stuff going on here, including the fact that John and his fellow early Baptists rejected the baptism of infants, um, like the Anabaptists, I think you might be able to tell where the name Baptist comes from, uh, by the fact that earlier in history, there was a group called the Anabaptists. Mm. Um, they don't believe, uh, babies should be baptized. Only adults can be baptized because like a baby can't choose to be Christian. Like yeah. a, a, an infant cannot accept Jesus Christ because it's a baby. <laughs> ah, yeah. yeah, that tracks. Yeah. That tracks to me. Now, an awful lot of people get murdered over this. Like it is astounding how many human beings are killed because some folks are like, what if only adults who could consent got baptized? That is a Big, big thing. So let's fucking now, kill each other. I love how the, so much yeah. death comes from um, <laughs> the holiness of God. And but in this case, how like, we should devote to him. This is just like, and this is again, so you see fundamentally the, the one of the big splits between other Protestant denominations and the Baptists is the Baptists are really focused on personal liberty and autonomy, right? The idea that you can't get baptized until you can fully choose, can make an informed choice as to whether or not to to, to be a Christian, um, which I think is broadly speaking better than dunking babies in the water. But mm. I also don't think baptizing babies has any particular effect on them because they're babies. They mm-hmm. don't remember shit. Um, you can do whatever, like and draw on water. Yeah, but if they die, yeah. they're you going give to ba- heaven. Ba- baths to babies. Well, yeah. If they die without being baptized, they go to hell. Um, I'm actually not a Christian, but I do believe that. Uh, just you know, that's the one that, that broke through. Babies the are one fundamentally that, yeah. evil. Common. Hell is just for babies. Yeah, special <laughs> place in hell babies. for babies. <laughs> baby hell, where it's like you you have to you have to. I don't know what would baby hell be. I guess like the like. I mean, that, just be a the, pile of ba- like just a room full of babies with no adults, right? Yeah, room full of babies. Honestly, no I have adults. to say that I think being a baby probably is hell. You're just mm. shitting it does yourself, seem difficult. and you can't. You don't ever know what's happening. Yeah, your body but then you move. get the things that you need and comfort from. Mm-hmm. All you got to do. Yeah, is but cry. I don't know who these big giant people coming at me really close with their giant faces. I think being a baby is probably an incredibly traumatic experience. <laughs> it does seem t- difficult having having known a couple of babies. It seems way harder than what it's I. Like, I do not basis. envy you, man. And then at one it starts being good because you can talk and like you, yeah you then you can start to fuck tyrant. around with people you know yeah yeah, yeah. we have um, that power okay so in the decades that follow john Smythe and the establishment of his church uh the baptist faith grows and it actually has a split very early on between a chunk of baptists who feel like um well, <laughs> is that the uh, it's like murder of crows chunk of baptists <laughs> yeah a chunk of baptists <laughs> yeah. yeah um the so half of them are like I don't know if it's exactly half, but one, a big chunk are like, anyone can be saved. Jesus Christ died for everybody, right? All you have to do, you have to mm-hmm. accept 
Christ as your Lord and Savior and, right. and you're saved. Bada bing, bada boom. That's and right. then there's a chunk that are like, no, a, God picked a small number of people all throughout history. I think it's like mm-hmm. 160,000 to be elect to go to heaven and everyone else goes to hell, oh, which shit. is a thing that only lunatics believe. But it's mm-hmm. very popular in this period. So as a general rule, Baptists were the anti-authoritarian strain of Christianity in this nice. period. They believed in a separation of church and state. They believed in freedom of conscience. Uh, conscience, and they believed in the value of individual life experience in preaching. And this is a big, this starts like, because the Catholic Church in this period, you don't g- insert your opinions into talking about the Bible. Uh-huh. You read the Bible, right? And you do the liturgy and you have this like creed that you read and it has all been laid down and other people, che- like your job is to go read the same thing every Catholic hears, right? Your job is not to extemporaneize from the fucking pulpit, you know? Um, and now the, you've got these Protestant denominations, and they have some different. There's Protestants who are like, no, because the Bible is inerrant. You preach just the Bible. Um, Baptists are like, well, no, your God made you as a unique person, and your experiences and ap- beliefs about faith are a part of like what God has given you. So you should share your personal experience with faith with other people, right? This scares the shit out of Anglican and Calvinist leaders. They do not like this. And the main reason why is that the Baptists really extend this attitude that like, well, God made us all the way we are with the capacity to make choices and experience things. And he wants us to share that with each other. So clearly women should be allowed to speak in church. This is a big problem for people. <laughs> so you, you've you got, you've got, I don't know Some if they're quite past people. Yeah. They're not quite pastors, I don't think, but you have women preaching the word of God in Baptist churches. And that is a real, like, folks get very ornery about that. Mm -hmm. Um, And spoilers, they still are today. So (laughs) through the 1700s, uh, Baptists were attacked uh, out of the fear that their beliefs would overthrow male leadership, not just in the church, but in government, right? And they believed that, like, men had been put above women. This is part of God's design. There will be chaos and and, and violence and horror if and, women you know, usurp this. It chaos in our lives. <laughs> and, you know, system and, oh, yeah. God, I'm sorry. I'm he just gonna, pops up I, throughout I the time. <laughs> yeah, Jordan B. Peterson would absolutely have been, like, li- oh like if he's in the 1700s, he's never not talking about Baptists. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. That's every hour of his life. And still still <laughs> claiming that um, patriarchy doesn't exist and mm-hmm. uh, has never existed and uh, it's made up uh, by but activists. Also, some hierarchies are ingrained within mm. the human soul. And You're older you than trees, you see. <laughs> older than trees! Direct quote. <laughs> <laughs> Promise you, direct quote. Peterson. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I want to quote right now from a very enlightening write-up in Religion Dispatches by Diana Bass. Quote, The Baptist commitment to liberty also shaped a revolution among Christian women, empowering them to exercise their spiritual gifts and take up leadership in the emerging religious movement. Indeed, one of the first attacks leveled at Baptists in England was that they scandalously allowed for she preachers, including yeah. one Mrs. <laughs> Sheachers, right? Sheachers, that's right. Including right one there, Mrs. Guys. Attaway. It's waiting yeah. for you. Get it together. Mm-hmm. Including one Mrs. Attaway, whose Tuesday afternoon Bible lectures in 1645 attracted as many as a thousand eager listeners. Baptist oh, yeah. women were among the greatest radicals of a revolutionary century, and they preached a gospel of visionary egalitarianism based in biblical injections like, your daughters will prophesy, and there is no longer male and female in Christ Jesus. <gasps> so God, I there's love, some radical shit going love, on in the Baptists. Love. Yeah this shit i love that's pretty cool radicalism yeah. Yeah. way back when i mean that does it for me so og I baptists a baptist yeah og baptists are fucking revolutionaries in a lot of ways I mean, in like this let you you open the door yeah. for women and look what they do for you yeah we are <laughs> abolishing gender 16th or 17th century mm-hmm. baptists yeah <laughs> um, now they're abolishing it score under Christ, Jesus, right. whatever specifically. Yeah, uh, yeah it's whatever. Um, so conservatives at the time struck back against progress, as is w- why they exist, um, and they accused Baptists of fomenting revolution and chaos. One pamphlet from the mid 1600s <laughs> warned that female Baptists quote Oh, you're going to like this, Katie. Female Baptists have quote. 
lately advanced themselves with vainglorious arrogance to preach in mixed <laughs> congregations of men and women in an insolent way, so usurping authority over men and assuming a calling unwarranted by the word of God for women to use, yet all under the color that they all as the spirit moves them, wherein they highly wrong and abuse the motions of the blessed spirit to make him to be the author of such of so much schism, disorder, and confusion, they being rather led by the strong delusions of the prince of darkness to countenance their in ignorance, pride, and vainglory. Baby, that's yeah. what we call word salad. Yeah. <laughs> you piss, because she's yeah. better at it than you. Mm -hmm. Better at preaching than you, Jordan mm. Peterson. Yeah, women, <laughs> um... <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> Bring him um, to this. So Baptist radicals were met with weaponized Bible quotes about how women need to, you know, stay quiet and submit mm -hmm. to their husbands and all that good mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, in England, a whole lot of Baptists get, get jailed for doing Baptist stuff. Um, and when they refuse to stop anyway, um, you know, things get – anyway, this is part of why a lot of Baptists wind up in North America, right? There are crackdowns across Europe of Baptist communities, and they're like – well, let's go colonize a place. Um, okay. Now, this is where things start to go wrong because number one, they're now becoming kind of implicit in the genocide or the series of genocides that are about to follow. Yeah. Um, but also because it's North America in the 1600s, they're gonna start to become complicit in slavery. Yeah. This is where things go awry. <laughs> Pretty good for a while, though. For a while. I, for, I'm like, we for can't a just end the episode where we were. <laughs> no. Yeah, so nice the Baptists. They had a good 30 years. <laughs> now tell so us that's, where that's it went like, wrong. Yeah. 30 years. Not per, even someone's like, lifetime. Genera oh, yeah. Half a generation? Yeah, that's not bad. You're I mean, like, that's I, yeah. good for the time. Mm -hmm. It's something. It's longer than we have left in as a United States. So I mean, it's uh, disappointing. Well. <laughs> yeah, it is disappointing. Um, it is. This is a there. Although it ends, this is this is a story that's going to end on a kind of hopeful note. Um, so that's good. This won't be as sad as a lot of things end. Although, right. boy, howdy, it's going to be a rough road to get there. So, <laughs> in the old country, right? <laughs> Baptists had lived in a slave state as well. The British Empire, most of the countries in Europe, slavery is if it's not within the country itself, the country's economy is heavily reliant upon slavery and like colonies and stuff, right? So obviously, Baptists and you know, but but personal ownership of slaves was not really much of a thing to the nearly to the extent that it became in like the U.S. South and Baptists were radicals. They they did not tend to have a lot of money. So you didn't have, before they kind of came to the U.S., I don't think there were really Baptist slave owners. Certainly not as any kind of organized group, right? Maybe there were some individuals who did. But in the United States, Baptists, because so many of them come over, in very short order, they are the largest Protestant sect in the new, you know, first in the colonies and then eventually in the new United States. And because there's a lot of them and because, you know, when you, travel to a country that's in the state of being born and that is appropriating and, and stealing a great deal of land, a lot of them wind up being rich and they get wealth and they get power and they get slaves mm -hmm. and they stop being quite so cool and radical. Um, so the first Baptists had been big. One of the foundational things about being a Baptist is that they are a non-hierarchical religion, um, which means that they abided by no state interference in their worship, unlike the Anglican Church, and they also have no bishops or popes. Their radicalism actually extended beyond that. Baptists had no unified creed. Uh, so like the Nicene Creed or whatever like that, they don't have anything like that. There's no liturgy. There's nothing that if you are a Baptist, every Baptist like reads this thing and like every Baptist goes straight other than like the Bible. But again, right. there's a lot of... <laughs> Of freedom and like how it's preached and like whatnot. So the Baptists in the United States very quickly start to split along kind of the same lines as the rest of the new country splits. Northern Baptists continue to hew to this anti-hierarchy intellectual tradition, and a lot of them do become abolitionists. A lot of Northern Bapti uh, Baptists are part of the abolition movement. But in the South, Baptists who had accumulated wealth and power and slaves start to see things very differently. Now, they still reject choice hierarchy, and they claim to not have a creed, but a growing number of them start to argue that slavery is not just acceptable, but is divinely inspired, the actual will of God. Mm -hmm. Dr. Richard Furman, who is an early Southern Baptist leader, wrote in a letter to the governor of South Carolina, quote, the right of holding slaves is clearly established in the Holy Scriptures, both by precept and example. Now, 
This causes a rift because by the 1800s, the you know mid 1800s, the 1840s, slavery. I don't know if you guys know this. Kind of a contentious issue in the United mm. States. Mm. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people I have disagree. Heard of that. <laughs> yeah. Did they smooth it That's, out? Yeah. They smoothed mm-hmm. it out. Though? Yes, they Didn't smoothed they it out. Did they get mad during... about it? Was there some sort of fight? <sighs> There's a people call it the big disagreement mm-hmm. that everything right, was fine after. Oh, the, oh, that everything was yeah. fine after. The yeah, civil debate. The civil debate, and then everything was good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That's what we had. <laughs> so <laughs> it happens. Obviously, the Civil War starts in 1860 in the United States. It happens a bit earlier for the Baptists. In 1845, there is a fundamental rift within the Baptist faith over the question of whether or not slaveholders can be missionaries. That's what kind of, again, there'd been a bunch Mm -hmm. of arguments and debates, but like fundamentally, this issue is kind of like winds up being the thing that that sets the kettle a boiling. Like, can slaveholders go out and preach the gospel? Can you can you go out and win souls for Christ while owning human mm. beings, right? That's a good question. Um, that what is a, a good question. question. Easy question, oh, well, but also yeah, a good easy one. easy question. The Northern Baptists would say, very easy question, no. Yeah. Um, but the Southern Baptists mm. say yes, and um. the Baptist faith splits, and the very first Southern Baptist convention takes place in Augusta, Georgia, in May of 1845. And I'm going to quote from a write-up in Pathios's Daylight Atheism blog. Quote, Largely comprised of slaveholders, the gathering endorsed the peculiar institution. Slavery was biblical. Abolition sinful. Baptists of the North were wrong to oppose slavery. Abolitionists bore responsibility for the Baptist division. Baptists of the South had been patient with the agitators. But enough was enough. Right? I, what a, we've it's just enough again was enough. tales all this time we've been very yeah. patient we've been very civil with us needing the slaves um yeah. but you you people need to calm down that's such a uh, it's amazing how the same thing is is it happens over forever and over, in a loop. And over. all the time time might be some sort of flat circle um i've heard so that. i've heard that <laughs> i've heard that Reggie um, Ledoux. Reggie Ledoux. I did God have, damn, I, I did an show. event in Austin recently, and I, I had a lunch in a couple of Lone Stars there, and I considered, I should have done it. I regret not doing it. <laughs> I should have bought a six-pack of Lone Star to walk into my book signing. Yes. And just like, oh, yeah. pounded six Lone Stars <laughs> yes, while, like, yes. ranting about nihilism Absolutely. to the and audience. And take out your knife <laughs> mm-hmm. and start yeah. carving the empties. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Robert, I see that in your future. I want that. I really oh, want that God. for you. Next time. I mean, what man doesn't want to grow up to be Rust Cole? Ab- like, mm. honestly. Uh, Beautiful man. Fucking uh, Harrison's character's name. God damn You're it. You're right. You're Woody Harrelson's character. Woody Harrelson's character. Nobody. Yeah. Anyway, whatever. Great, great season of television. Never yeah. watched the show again after that. Don't Sorry know for saying Harrison. Had me good oh, yeah. Not listening. worth after yeah. that. Wait, do we mm-hmm. need an ad break? It's not. Yeah. You know who? We Reggie Ledoux. We Reggie oh, Ledoux. Yeah, oh, Cody, uh, you fucking uh, Reggie Ledid it. You Reggie yeah. Ledid it. So go, go, go watch the first season of True Detective again and also listen to these ads. <laughs> <laughs> They're the same length. <laughs> oh, we're back. Um, boy, that was a pretty good boy. show, True Detective. Mm. It was. Mm-hmm. Loved it. Pretty good Loved show. Loved that show. Enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the Southern Baptist faith grows rapidly uh, after 1845. And, it, you know, it's got, there's a lot of slave money behind it, which allows them to do things like set up a shitload of schools and build a really, really powerful publishing arm to start pushing out newspapers and magazines all over, the, primarily the South. Now, the faith is is decentralized on paper. Again, there's no central church. There's no pope. But you will start to have these very wealthy institutions arrive that are putting out content for schools that are putting out like stuff, for, you know, training uh, pastors and whatnot. Um, and as a result, things, even though the Baptists, Southern Baptists say that it's decentralized, things get very fucking centralized, right? Um, you start mm-hmm. to congregate a lot of power in these institutions that are influential for the Southern Baptists. Um, and of course, because the men who are funding them and running them our slaveholders, mm. supporting slavery becomes a religious creed for the Southern Baptists. In 1850, one Baptist news editor wrote, quote, as a question of morals, it is between us and God. As a question of political economy, it is with us alone as free and independent states. Ah, right? mm. that, interesting what? word choice. That <laughs> yeah, word, yeah. What's that word? What's that first word you said? In what? Yeah. States? 
Oh my yeah, God. Uh, it's cool. So oh. in 1856, a prominent Alabama Baptist leader labels slavery, quote, as much an institution of heaven as marriage. Basically saying, of course there will be slaves in heaven. Uh, it wouldn't be heaven if I didn't own people. Uh, how could I be happy without my property? <laughs> yeah, it's very okay. interesting. Based tying me. slavery to marriage. Yeah, for the it, is, it is interesting. Interesting. Make my mm-hmm. stomach churn every mm-hmm. time I think about how recent all this shit is. Like it's like, it's not all that far ago, actually. Fifty mother fucking yeah. god. This is like a hundred years before Martin Luther King is is marching around. It's, you know, it's like not that our distant from us. Parents' yeah. lifetime, like. I mean, not 1850, our, but our, like, our grandparents knew people who'd been alive in mm-hmm. this period. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Or at least could have. So the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary is founded in 1859 in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, and it provides the Southern Baptists with a place to train their clergy. Again, part of the thing with Baptists is that there's supposed to be no centralized control over clergy. People are not like, it's not like, you know, if you, like being a Catholic priest, it's like a whole fucking deal, right? Like you gotta like, it's like becoming a mechanic or something. Um, you can just get declared a sudden. Like if your congregation says, "Hey, we like this guy. He's the pastor. You're the fucking pastor," right? Mm-hmm. But now they also have a seminary um, that is training people to be pastors, which is very centralized. Oh, and by the way, the four guys who own the seminary own fifty slaves in between them. <laughs> yeah. um, so when Abraham that wasn't Lincoln a real was laugh. elected. No, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> it's good times. It's good times. It so Abraham good, Lincoln get, gets elected, and the very normal dudes at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary reacted as you had expect by immediately arguing for secession. Uh, now, some Baptist leaders had been arguing for secession in the early 1850s, and the Southern Baptist faith overwhelmingly supported the Confederacy in the Civil War that followed, which should not be a surprise. In an 1863 meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention, SBTS founder John Broadus, seen by some as almost the founding father of like the Southern Baptist Convention, wrote and submitted resolutions pledging Southern Baptist support for the Confederacy. Now, Cody, I know you're just like uh, on page 105 of your U.S. history textbook from middle mm-hmm. school, but mm-hmm. I'm going to spoil something for you. <gasps> Civil War doesn't go great for the Confederacy. What? what? Uh, yeah, I know. And I'm sorry. I know you were just getting there, right? Uh, but the flags are still around. It seems like it was <laughs> successful. I, I see why that's confusing, Cody. Um, but They're no, it does not work out. victory, right? They... Th- they're celebrating a victory. Um, okay. We're actually kind of getting to some of that. So, oh, good. Yeah. So the oh, South good. South loses the war and kind of as a result of the South losing the war and a number of things that happened with it, there are rather fewer living Southern Baptist men in 1865 than there had been in 1860. Mm. Um, now, emancipation and the end of the war leads eventually to something that kind of starts to approach equal rights for black people, right? Um and obviously, this is not an even, you know, you've got your reconstruction period where things are looking good. You've got this horrible crackdown. Uh, you've got the establishment of Jim Crow laws. And the SBTS, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, um, and thus the leadership of the faith, are hugely in favor of Jim Crow. And in finding ways to reduce and eliminate any kind of legal equality that black people might have. Um, the people who are kind of running the Southern Baptist Convention oppose equality and support the separation of white and black people. Professor William Wilson assured his students, whites will rule in the South still. Now, some Southern Baptist leaders, like Broadus, did evolve their views as time went on. Broadus eventually came around as believing slavery was wrong in 1882. I don't give him a lot of points for that. Like, you'll see defenders of Southern Baptist leaders being like, well, look, no, Broadus realized that it was wrong. It's like, yeah, in the 1880s. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, man, if you're like raised in the slaveholding South and in like 1850, you're like, you know what? This is wrong. Fuck it. I'm an abolitionist now. You get a lot of points. It's hard to... Mm-hmm evolve beyond the things that your culture considers fine when they're immoral. That's a, that's, that takes courage. 1882. I don't really care that you came around, man, you know, radical anymore. Like, yeah. Like get a golf clap. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, That's not really like good, I guess, but okay. Um, But he also argues against those in the faith. What he does do is he argues against Southern Baptists. Once the war is over and they've lost, he does argue against people within his, his religion who think that black worship is less acceptable to God than white worship. 
Um, and as a result, there start to be a few black Southern Baptist churches. Now, this is a more significant chunk of the faith. Now, it's still not most. I think it's like 7% of, of SBC churches are, are majority black. Um, but black Southern Baptists do grow to be a more significant chunk of the faith throughout the early 1940s. And particularly in the modern period, a, 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 an actually kind of disproportionate chunk of pastors are black. Um, but yeah, uh, the Southern Baptists, black Southern Baptists do become more of a, a factor in, in the faith, even as kind of leaders of the Southern Baptist convention take advantage of this racist system that they've built in the post-war South. And for more information on that, I want to quote from an investigation published by the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, that's actually kind of a spoiler for where some of this ends, but this is the same institution that we were just reading a bunch of arguments for why God loves slavery. Quote, <laughs> Joseph E. Brown, the seminary's most important donor and chairman of its board of trustees, 1880 to 1894, earned much of his fortune by the exploitation of mostly black convict lease laborers. Joseph E. Brown's coal mines and iron furnaces coerced the full extent of labor from Georgia convicts by employing the same brutal punishments and tortures formerly employed by slave drivers. The legal system entrapped thousands of black men, often on trumped up charges and without any due process protections, and earned money for sheriffs and state treasuries by selling their labor. It was worse than slavery. Investigations of Brown's Dade Coal Operation concluded that if there is a hell on earth, it is the Dade Coal Mines. Brown reaped enormous profits from his coal and iron businesses. His 1880 gift of $50,000 was instrumental in saving the seminary from financial collapse. At his death, the seminary honored him for his service as a trustee and for the generous financial support he had provided. Okay. Yep. Pretty bad. That mm -hmm. guy. Pretty bad stuff. <laughs> um... So as you might guess, though, the SBTS recently has done some broadly admirable things in terms of grappling with its legacy. But of course, even in these, again, broadly admirable, because there's some really uh, good work they've done on kind of the fucked up parts of their history, they also still toss some bullshit up in there. Um, for example, again, most of these Southern Baptist sources you'll find grappling with their legacy will note that guys like Broadus came around and that other theological leaders, specifically William J. McLaughlin, loudly repudiated the children of Ham stuff, which is, do you guys know anything about that? No. It's also a thing in the Mormon church. There's this idea. Children that of Ham? Yeah, there's like some shit in the Bible about these like children, these like, city, you know how there's all these cities God gets mad at in the Old Testament for like stuff. Uh, okay, so Ham's a city. Yeah, yeah. The Mormon church will be preaching that kind of shit up until like when we were little kids, <laughs> you know? Um, so, but some guys in this period, in this kind of like late end of the 1800s, very early 1900s, there are some Southern Baptist leaders who are like repudiating that. Um, but... And this is good. It's important in your analyses of racism to mention stuff like that. But then after doing some really good research, you get lines like this, quote, several faculty and trustees lamented the prevalence of lynching in the South, which is like, why, why would you even include like the fact that someone are like, yeah, lynching seems fucked up. Yeah. That's not. I That's not like a point in anybody's corner, the, right? Yeah. Bringing down our property <laughs> yeah. values. All oh, what a bummer. <laughs> yeah. Lament is like such a weird yeah. word for that. <laughs> It's weird, like, maybe just don't even include that, right? If somebody did something to try to stop lynching, sure, of course, that's a part of your history, yeah. too. But no, uh, they, felt, but like, they felt no, anxiety that's a <laughs> about it. <Yeah. laughs> like, but also, this is going to be a pattern. Th this exact kind of thing where you're like, well, we're not going to do anything, and we're not going to take any action to try to make this less common, but we'll say it's bad, right? That is a real strong through line in the mm -hmm. Southern Baptist Convention and the seminary, all that good stuff. So, um... While they lamented lynching, the SBTS approved of the lost cause mythology, uh, which spread in Southern Baptist schools and churches. And that, Cody, is a big part of why you see so many Confederate flag stickers on cars. Um, <sighs> Okay. This ahistoric take, we'll talk, we'll do a whole thing on the lost cause at some point, but basically it describes the civil war as a conflict caused by not the South's desire to in like maintain a nightmare system of like human bondage, but because of the South's need to uphold their honor and, you know, states rights and all this is there's this like noble culture that like, and may, sometimes like the people who are smarter about it be like, well, slavery was bad, but it wasn't any worse in the South than it wasn't all these other places. And like, there was all these good things and it wasn't just about like, obviously it was about slavery. The Confederates at the time were like, yeah, it's about fucking slaves. Literally. Yeah. Um, yeah. Google like, the They weren't coy about it. It's all, it's all there. Yeah. 
Um, Archibald T. Robertson, a prominent professor at the SBTS in the early 1900s, supported and taught the books of Thomas Dixon as like major uh, Southern Baptist like texts in their schools. Do you know who Thomas Dixon was? He wrote The Klansman, which was adapted in 1915 to the ah. film The Birth of a Nation. Mm. Um, Great so this guy. guy's books are all over Southern Baptist schools cool. in the early 1900s. Cool, That's cool, good. cool. Yeah. It's good to be educated. Yeah. yeah. Now, the Reading's SBT... Important. Reading is yeah. good. <laughs> Reading is p- important. It's great to learn because <laughs> knowledge is white power. Knowledge is white power. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> knowledge is white power. Oh, Christ. Um, so, SBTS faculty supported segregation until 1940, which, if we're going to be totally fair, means they were ahead of a lot of the United yeah, States. Yeah, they beat some folks. They yeah. were not the last, you know? Um, that That's 1940 is when the SBTS admits its first black students. Again, and this is the school that can like train people to become pastors. The process of giving up segregation was uneven because there's a bunch of Southern Baptist schools and stuff, but the SBTS integrates, like as a general rule, they integrate their classrooms in 1951 uh, under the advice of Southern Baptist Convention President Ellis Fuller. Um, This puts them like three years ahead of the federal mandate. Um, In general, SBTS faculty and much of the Southern Baptist leadership supported the civil rights movement with hesitation, but apparently with some honesty. And in 1961, they invite Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to speak, um, which isn't nothing. Um, So they are they do like while there is this strong conservative chunk, they are able to like they're not on the side that's, you know, uh, anti Martin Luther King. Yeah, they're not like fighting tooth and nail again. Right, right, right. It's it's just kind of more like, well, I guess we're getting dragged into the present, but maybe that's not bad, which is not the worst that anyone in America handles things. Yeah. (laughs) It's not the best. I don't give them a lot of credit. Yeah, but not the worst. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, let's give them a C. Give them a C. Mm. Um, C so by yeah. (laughs) By the early nineteen minus? No, I said C minus. Sorry. C minus. Yeah, that's fair. Robert. By the early 1960s, a huge chunk of the faith had become quite liberal in their doctrine um, and progressive on a whole so- host of social and political issues. A lot of this has to do with the growth of uh, of, of black churches, black Southern Baptist churches. Um, and yeah, only about 6% of Southern Baptists are black, but something like one fifth of their churches are headed by black pastors. Um, and in this period, a lot of those folks are kind of more liberal. A lot of, no, they're not the only ones. There's, you know, there's this, this is the sixties, right? Like there's this kind of progressive wave that's sweeping over a lot of the country. Um, now, as I've noted a few times, there is no creed for Southern Baptists, but they do have an, what they call an outline of faith, which is basically a creed. Um, it's yeah. called the, yeah, it's called the Baptist faith and message. One thing that does legitimately separate the SBC from other faiths is that the faith and message is edited and revised over over time and reflective to democratic or at least kind of quasi democratic pressure. Some segment of people within kind of the faith every year kind of like vote on things that will be ways in which this will be like added and like different motions and stuff. So it is much more, the Southern Baptist convention is much more able to kind of move with the times than a lot of denominations that, that are so, you know, for as large and as centralized as it becomes, it is kind of more reflective, able to be more reflective of the times. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to quote from a write-up by religion dispatches here. The first version was issued in 1925 during the heyday of the fundamentalist modernist crisis. A 1963 revision toned down the fundamentalism of the older statement, articulating more strongly Baptist latitude and doctrine that favored the liberty of conscience. So you see, you've got this throughout the early part of the country. While there's also, you know, the things going on in the country about like the civil rights movement and all this other stuff, within the Baptist faith, there's this debate over fundamentalism. Is the Bible perfectly inerrant and unquestionable and something to be taken totally literally or can we be like not lunatics about how we read the bible right uh, and in kind of this period for the middle of the century the people who are like yeah let's adapt our faith to the modern era and uh, like be different than people were in the, the 1920s or in the 1860s or whatever those folks are winning like they're yeah. winning for a while. Yeah. Um, now this opened things up for Baptist churches that might in the future come to embrace and support even more radical ideas, women's rights, gay rights, all that good stuff. So, and indeed Baptists for a time were some of the most liberal denominations from 1965 to 1968. 
uh, when abortion was kind of starting to become a hotbed issue in the United States, Baptist publications did not mention abortion. Like there's no evidence of it being an issue at all, uh, nor did any Baptist body take action on it one way or the other. In 1970, a poll by the Baptist Sunday School Board found that 70% of pastors supported abortion to protect the mother and 71% in the case of rape. In 1973, a poll by the Baptist Standard News Journal found that 90% of Texas Baptists believe the state's abortion laws were too restrictive. Cannot emphasize how different mm-hmm. things were back mm-hmm. then. That's mm-hmm. wild. <laughs> yeah. And again, we talk about this in our episodes on the the religious right and the moral majority. This is, it's it's not that big. It is starting to become politicized. Uh, and obviously Catholics have always been against it, right? But fucking Protestants don't have a long history in the United States of giving a shit about abortion. Now, 1973 is the year Roe v. Wade, you know, happens. Um, and the Southern Baptist Convention endorses the right to choose in their, their big voting majig that year. Now, this makes some people happy, but it makes a lot of people angry, uh, and it particularly infuriates a shithead named Larry Lewis. Larry is a St. Louis pastor who went on to run the North American Mission Board. This is like the board that's, we will be talking about them a lot later. They're like the folks running the SBC's like mission, because like that's the whole big deal for them, going out and preaching to people. So in 1979, uh, Larry Lewis picks up a newspaper that listed the Southern Baptist Convention alongside the Unitarian Church as supportive of abortion. As he later recalled, quote, that bothered me a lot. So now I'm going to quote from a write-up by the Baptist press, who suck and should gargle glass. Quote, so Lewis did something about it, proposing in 1980 the first of more than 20 pro-life resolutions adopted by the SBC over the next few decades. When Lewis became HMB, Home Mission Board President, of, uh, in 1987, one of his first actions was to create the Office of Abortion Alternatives to help churches establish crisis pregnancy centers. We uh-huh. did an episode of It Could Happen Here on Crisis Pregnancy Centers. Not great stuff. Not great. Do they not help? IMO, no. Um, mm. I, I would say not. So, you know, this is, again, we have a couple of periods, one in the late 1600s and one now where, like, things were going great for a while, and now they start to get fucked up again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um So Lewis was just one of the conservative white leaders of the church who started in the 1980s flipping the fuck out about how the evil liberals were taking over America's most racist faith. Uh, Most particularly and most significantly, some of the leaders this scared were two guys named Paige Patterson and Paul Pressler. Uh, now, these were both prominent Southern Those Baptists. Those are some names. Solid I know, names. I know. Uh, you a lot just of know. Here. Oh my God! You just know. Uh, fucking Paige Pressler, you or, <laughs> or fucking Paige Patterson or Paul Pressler. Both of those guys, you know, have like opinions about inner city crime that are oh, basically yeah. like basically a fucking um, uh, neo Nazi tract from the nineteen seventies. Oh, sure. like, yeah, like, absolutely. Like absolutely. racial profiling. Like, oh my God! Speciesism um, or some shit. Yeah. Like, yeah, I am a nominative determinalist. Um, For example, you hear the name Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. You know what that guy's going to be serving. Mm -hmm. He's going to have a lot of opinions about snakes and gardens. (laughs) Um, I I have to interject, I think it is time for another ad break, unless I'm mistaken. Yes, you know who else has strong opinions about racial hierarchies? Oh, the, oh. They don't believe there should be any hierarchy. The only hierarchy Jeez, geez. believes in is the hierarchy of children on the private hunting preserve they keep going off of the coast of Indonesia and the people who hunt those children, as God <laughs> intended. Promo code. Uh, <laughs> Promo code. Promo code uh, how do you spell brisket. that? Brisket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. However you want. Yeah. It's not going to yeah. work. Ah, oh, we're back. So we're talking about Paige Patterson and Paul Pressler, who are not wild in the, and again, this kind of, the 80s is when this all really ramps up, but the 70s, the Carter administration in particular, is when these guys all start being like, we got to take our faith back from these fucking liberals. Mm -hmm. Now, Paige had started preaching as a teenager, and he moved on to occupy several positions running churches across the filthy ass South. He became president. I always want to get some scabby teen up there telling me about <laughs> oh, God yeah. and life. There's yeah. no one I, yeah, nobody I Voice trust cracking more. <laughs> all the better. Yeah. It's like every time I see Mormon missionaries, and it's like, my dudes. This is your first time out of the house. What do you yeah. what What do you know about life? What do Why you are you going door to door to, 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 to like? Come on, man. 
Like, are you offering? Go, what do you? <laughs> yeah. Go work at a Sparrow or some shit. Like, get some <laughs> life experience. You know. You've got um, an opening at Dairy Queen. Yeah, oh seriously, dude. Like, what? A, come on. Um. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Paige starts as a t- teenager. He becomes president of Criswell College in Dallas, Texas. Uh, there's my city of hate in 1975. <laughs> now, Criswell is a private Baptist college. It started as a Bible institute. And as its president, it was Paige's job to inculcate new generations in the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. He is one of these fundamentalists, you know? Um, and he's not a big fan of Roe v. Wade. He does not like the wo- idea either that women can be ordained as ministers, which is starting to happen. He's really does doesn't like that. And again, that's very anti-Baptist originalism, right? Like, dude, like, you need to go back. Yeah, my the dude. Oh, geez. Be a little more conservative, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, he doesn't like this. Uh, and he believes the Bible included, quote, an assignment from God, in this case, that women that a woman not be involved in teaching or ruling capacity over men. Mm. Says who? Says you? Says him? Well, it's very revealing of his attitude, too, because if it's like a normal person to be like, well, yeah, why wouldn't I mean, if it's all that matters to preach is like your relationship with God and God loves everybody equally. Why wouldn't a woman be able to preach? And his attitude is if you are a preacher, you are ruling Uh and women can't Uh rule. Uh-huh. Like, and it's uh-huh. like, yeah, uh-huh. man, maybe that's uh-huh. fu- maybe you shouldn't be doing anything like maybe fuck you entirely. <laughs> oh my God. Maybe you so, need to sit down. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you need to sit the fuck down, bro. Um, so Paul Pressler was a judge uh, and an extremely rich kid whose father was a Harvard graduate and the vice president of Exxon Mobil. Good uh, Lord. Uh, oh, yeah. You just kept oh, going. yeah. You, you just yeah. couldn't stop fucking talking. That's the good stuff. Oh, oh when will you hear about this piece of shit? So Paul goes to Princeton and in his... <laughs> I really I, thought I, you were I just going to say prison. <laughs> I don't normally use Wikipedia as sources, but his Wikipedia biography is clearly wit- written by like somebody he paid to update Hell his yeah. Wikipedia. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and it, it, uh, it includes lines stating that he, quote, confronted theological liberalism head on, having uh-huh. never wavered in the faith acquired in his youth. Yeah, uh-huh. now, unwavering. That's right. These these guys both will have several positions within the SBC. Um, Patterson's going to lead it for a while. And being guys who suck, they were both good friends. And together, the two <laughs> hatched a plan. This is in like the 1970s. They sit down. This is like part, a huge part of Southern Baptist lore today. These two fuckers sit down at the Cafe du Monde in New Orleans. Um, and a former Southern Baptist leader who now preaches against this kind of shit, Russell Moore, describes how they, quote, mapped out on a napkin how the convention could restore a commitment to the truth of the Bible and to faithfulness of its confessional documents. Now, it took these guys like a decade to organize the kind of fuckery that it it took to wrench the Southern Baptist Convention to the far right. But Patterson and Pressler used their influence methodically to weld together Southern Baptist conservative pastors into a voting block capable of manipulating the convention's procedures in their favor. In a write-up for The Atlantic, Jonathan Merritt describes how it all came together. The two men successfully executed their strategy in the subsequent decades, a movement they labeled the conservative resurgence and their opponents dubbed the fundamentalist takeover. Whatever one calls it, the result was a purging of moderates from among denominational ranks, the codifying of literal interpretations of the Bible, and the transformation of the Southern Baptist Convention into a powerful ally of the Republican Party. Mm. Great. Good stuff, we huh? It. We great, did it. We great, got great, there. Great, it's great, good stuff. Yay. Love it. We love okay, it. we're Yay. catching up. Yeah. So Patterson and Pressler and their allies, uh, they see the 1963 revision of the faith and message, which is, again, that creed that's not a creed, as a mistake. They call it, quote, an open door to a less biblical church. When they began to take over shit in the mid 80s, and that's really when this starts to come together, it's like 84, 85, support for abortion was one of the first things to go. But as religion dispatches notes, they quickly moved beyond that. Quote, Among their first targets were women, the Baptist women in ministry. By 1987, approximately 500 women had been ordained by the SBC, and most especially, women in the home. Southern Baptist fundamentalists busied themselves by creating an entire movement called complementarianism, a theological doctrine of equal but separate sexes based on the joyful submission of wives and the restriction of female authority. In 1998, they succeeded in adding a new article to the Baptist faith and message on the theology of the family. 
The wife and husband are of equal worth before God, since both are created in God's image. The marriage relationship models the way God relates to his people. A husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. He has the God-given responsibility to provide for, to protect, and to lead his family. A wife is to submit herself graciously to the servant leadership of her husband, even as the church willingly submits to the headship of Christ. It sounds... Sounds like it sucks. <laughs> sounds, I mean, sounds exactly what I expected. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not, it's like you're, you're describing my actual hell. Yeah. A, um, a good buddy. It's, a, of mine. it's an equal, equal, uh, uh, separate, but equal hell. Separate, yeah. yeah, exactly. Separate, That's yeah. Fine. Like men you, are, you, are trapped in this like hell of machismo where they're, they're forced to deny all the aspects of their, of their personalities that like, aren't this kind of toxic masculinity and women are trapped in like an eternal prison. It's great. Yeah. What God wants. It's the same, but everybody. different. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually had a buddy when I was growing up, um, was a lot older than me. I mean, we played D&D &D together, and he was, um, uh, I'm actually not, I think it was his church. I'm not sure it was his church or his wife's, but he, he he gets, you know, hitched and he gets married, and wife's a lovely person. They they seem to have a, a re they're still together, seem to have a good relationship. She's very much like that kind of more um, um, uh, uh, forceful one of the two, but they had, they, 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 they went to their wedding was in this like very fundamentalist Southern Baptist church. And I, I'm not sure maybe the preacher could like read the vibes of the actual relationship, but he spent like 10 minutes talking about the importance of like the woman submitting to her husband. It was like super awkward. <laughs> There are all these glances between people mm -hmm. of like, okay, buddy, you're really going on about this, huh? <laughs> uh, it's fun stuff. So it sounds um, very fun. Yeah, it does yeah, sound yeah. fun. Yeah, Texas small town churches, good good places. So hierarchy and patriarchy were now written into a not a creed creed that churches had to accept in order to consider themselves Southern Baptists. This caused yet another major major schism. A lot of moderates left the convention and started to make new denominations. Um, and in fact, more recently, President Jimmy Carter, history's greatest monster, renounced his membership in the church. He told one interviewer, at its most repugnant, the belief that women must be subjugated to the wishes of men excuses slavery, violence, forced prostitution, genital mutilation and national laws that omit rape as a crime, but it also costs many millions of girls and women control over their own bodies and lives and continues to deny them fair access to education, health, employment, and influence within their own communities. I mean, he's, he's, he's been pretty solid for a while, but also it's, it's worth noting again to talk about how this changes. Carter is, considers himself a member of the Southern Baptist faith for a long time. Like, um, because again, this shift is not all that old, you know? Yeah. Um, no, yeah, I mean, you keep saying I mean, that's like, like a whiplash yeah, yeah. kind of a shift. Yeah, too, to yeah, because it again, yeah. and it's happened a couple of times, right? You know, yeah. with with the, the slavery and everything too. So Patterson and Pressler did not give a shit about the things that Jimmy Carter has an issue with, and they celebrated their victory over their great enemy, women, by carrying out a mass <laughs> wedding ceremony in the year two thousand. They led five. Hmm? No, you're continuing. You don't have to. Yeah. Wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was an uh, involuntary word that uttered out of my mouth. Like, Wait, hold up! Yeah. No, but please don't stop. Um, they led 550 couples to renew their wedding vows, uh, only this time with more misogyny because they'd added these misogynist planks to the faith. Quote. Wives reciprocated and in one accord, pledging to graciously submit and honor their husband's role as servant leader while acknowledging their responsibilities and wi as wife and mother as, quote, priority above all else except God. It makes me... Unhappy to hear. Except this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know this happens, I understand, yes. but it's like it's there's a lot of reasons this is funny, including the fact that all of the dudes who are horny about this are the same kind of people who will point out like, Well, Islam means submission. And it's like, man, mm -hmm. your faiths have the same fucking problems. Yeah, Chill out, dude. Yeah. Like, Many faiths. So yeah, and I yeah, and I do yeah. think about a lot <laughs> lately, how do you not all the time? Just about the way people participate in their own oppression and yeah. um, and the stories that you're told and growing up and in communities and environments like this where you, you know, or whatever figures that push you into thinking that this is who you are and what you're worth and what your role mm -hmm. is. And that, th and you become that's, that starts to feel like safety. Yeah. Even though for a lot of these people, it was probably very dangerous to oh. consent to consent that your husband has control and yeah. like, that you relinquish to that. I'm sure that they were. I'm sure that there's a lot of abuse 
I know we're getting oh, to stuff. Oh, Katie. Uh, uh. <laughs> Boy is there. Yeah. So convention leadership was in lockstep behind all of these changes. A statement signed by many prominent Southern Baptist pastors and teachers affirmed this, stating, quote, We are convinced a denial or neglect of these principles will lead to increasingly destructive consequences in our families, our churches, and the culture at large. Now, for most of the 21st century, the Southern Baptist Convention has been a reliable reservoir of the most regressive attitudes of our era. Gay pastors were also banned in the SBC organizing documents. Interestingly enough, here's a fun fact for you kids. Mm. You know who's not banned for being an SBC pastor? Sex offenders. What the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) That's just fine and dandy. But Robert. But. Yeah. But. But maybe... Okay, but. Cody, <laughs> what you're failing to account for is that Paige Patterson has a lot of friends who are sex offenders. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't realize that he was... Yeah, okay. he's got a bunch really of buddies who are doing sex okay. crimes. Well, you gotta so protect awkward. his buddies. Okay. Yeah, you gotta like, bring your buddies. Among us? Yeah. Who among us Baptists look, hasn't? Look, like, if, Katie, if, like, you were trying to get a place and your landlord, you know, called me as a reference, like, I would say, oh, yeah, Katie, she's got, like, a 750 credit rating or, or whatever. Is that good? Yeah. What is good for credit? That's good, right? I think that is good. That's I know that good. that is good. No, that's good. Okay. So if he's so in say 800, I don't know what it, so I don't know. 750 I don't know credit. is a very, excuse me, everybody listening. 750 is a very good credit Look, score. Don't listen. You didn't see Sophie go, meh, but I will. I will. The, what's important, Katie, is I will lie to your <laughs> landlord about your credit. Thank you. Thank you so much. And in the same way, Paige Patterson is going to make sure that his friends who were repeatedly committing sex crimes can be ba- pastors. You're going to have to stop convention. you there, Robert. Uh, in the same way is the phrase that you just used. Um, and I, I wonder maybe if they're not comparable situations, but uh, we can leave it at that. We don't have to explore that. We don't have to explore that. You know, we can explore, Cody, Katie. Mm. It's a guy named Daryl Gilliard. Now, in the uh, 1980s, I don't like the sound of him. Uh, Gilliard Did is you one say of these. Daryl or Garrel? Daryl. Daryl Gilliard. Yeah. Daryl is an um, incredible Gilliard name. Would be amazing. <laughs> so he is one of the SBC's like prominent black uh, pastors, and he specifically there's this guy. Let me pull up his name, um, whose name will be familiar to a lot of people. Who is like uh, one sec. Uh, there's this dude, pastor named Vines, who's like another prominent black, like the the like most kind of like celebrity uh, SBC black preacher. And Gilliard is considered to be like, oh, this is like he's he's the new version of this guy. He's like huge for us, makes a shitload of money, very popular. Um, and he's a protege of Paige Patterson, um, who calls him, quote, the nation's next great African-American preacher. Um, he becomes prominent when he earns several appearances on Jerry Falwell's national TV show. Super charismatic. And he has this backstory. He has this like lurid story about how he's like a, raised as a homeless orphan, you know, in, in <clears throat> uh, a poor place. And which none of it's true. It's like all lies. He's not raised as a homeless orphan. Mm. But that's a good story. Um, and now I'm going to quote next from... <laughs> The problematic source, Baptist News. Beginning in 1985, Gilliard was hired and then forced out of positions at three Dallas area churches, Victory Baptist Church in Richardson, Concord Missionary Baptist Church in Dallas, and Shiloh Baptist Church in Garland. He was similarly hired and forced to resign at Hilltop Baptist Church in Norman, Oklahoma. At least 25 women in the Dallas church publicly accused him of sexual misconduct. Um, So that is how the Southern Baptists, when they have to admit that this is a thing that happened, talk about it right uh that, that, that's that's their summary of this guy's crimes um it's actually quite a lot worse than that um I and, but that is. already sounded bad I but that already is. doesn't yeah wait a second uh, hold up i'm gonna quote from an article in the houston chronicle by rob downen uh by rob downen sorry rob um uh yeah uh, about <laughs> what was actually going on with uh with with uh, monsignor gilbert um Two years after Gilliard's 1991 ouster, he began pastoring a non-SBC congregation a few blocks away from Vines' megachurch in Jacksonville, Florida. While there, he was convicted of sex crimes involving two teens. He faced multiple civil suits, including one eventually settled from a grieving widow who alleged that she was raped and impregnated by him during counseling sessions. Oh, my God. Very bad dude. Now, a big part of how he's able to do this is he is personal friends with Patterson and with Vines who are like fucking running the SBC in a lot of ways. Um, 
And so he'll tell his victims like, hey, you know, if you have a problem with what I'm doing, like take it up with fucking Paige Patterson, you know, take it up with Vines, right? These guys who are like um, the, the and, and for his part, as these, he keeps getting kicked out of churches, you know, for doing sex crimes. Uh, Patterson backs him to the uh, to the hilt. Um, to quote from the Houston Chronicle, quote, um, Patterson wrote that Gilliard was not guilty of the allegations or morally culpable. He said that Bailey, one of uh, uh, this guy's victims, must forget the past and should refrain from making public statements while Patterson worked to rehabilitate the gifted young preacher from his mistakes, sorrow, and humiliation. He is no longer a problem to you, Patterson wrote. He is worth salvage. Will you agree not to disparage him any further, thus giving me a chance to help Daryl count for God and for good? Fuck God you. God good, huh? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's cool. Can we all <laughs> agree to not mm-hmm. disparage this poor Don't man? Don't disparage him with your talk of him raping a Hold green Hold your yeah, tongues shows, about his abuse. Yeah. Show some How respect. can you be so cruel? He's be in more pain. Civil. Yeah, he's good at talking in a pulpit, guys. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you not understand the stakes here? But also, this is the argument they'll make, is that like, well, honestly, it's not that bad if he's committing multiple sex crimes, as long as he's winning souls. Because they don't see the the victims as mattering. He's winning. You suffer, well, it's also just like, you know, if you're a victim, you know, that's bad and everything, but you just suffer once, right? It's just a few minutes. Whereas Mm -hmm. if you win a soul to Christ, that's that's an eternity Mm -hmm. of of torment that they're saved from. That, and the thing is, that that is the logic. Yeah. And uh, here's the, I mean, this goes so much deeper than that, but that, if that is what you believe, by God, you can justify damn near anything. Anything, yeah. Yeah. Um, Which is... (laughs) A problem. Um, Bigger than this, but this is one of the reasons in which that's a nightmare problem. So with Patterson's help, again, Gilliard repeatedly gets jobs, preaching at one point to more than 7,000 people at a church in Florida. Um, And Patterson would later claim that since he'd been part of the panel that had investigated allegations against Gilliard and, quote, got him to confess that guilt publicly, it was fine for him to help Gilliard get jobs to preach elsewhere. He said he was sorry. What more do you want from me, effectively the leader of the Southern Baptist Convention? People, what else can happen? What can you do? Yes. Now, in 2000, the same year that he remarried 550 people with his buddy, the judge, Patterson sent a letter to a pastor asking him for advice on stopping sexual abuse in a church. So this pastor writes a letter to Paige Patterson is like, hey, I am concerned about sexual abuse happening within my church. What is your advice for like avoid, you know, for protecting my, my with a reasonable thing to do, right? You're leading mm. a church. This is the guy who's running things. You want his advice. I don't want anyone to get hurt in my congregation. Yeah. Paige's advice was for him to quote, hold lunch and one hour awareness seminars, not because they'll stop abuse, but so that if there is ever a lawsuit over sexual abuse, it will look like the church did something to try Yeah, you to smooth it, it over. Yep. You have these exactly. sort of seminars. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, now, not long after all this, um, again, early 2000s, the Catholic Church's sex abuse scandal blows wide open. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but there's been a couple of problems within the Catholic Church about sex abuse. Mm, One I'll or two. Look, I'll have to look into that. I don't necessarily... A year. For uh, centuries, you know, not deal, that big but. a deal, but yeah. So this is a big, big story, um, and it, it, because it's a big story, it it, it kind of it, again. There's there's a couple of things. There's this anti democratic, very right wing, very centralized thing happening, but there's also still if a bunch of Southern Baptists have the mood take them by something that happens, they can pass resolutions that are like good, broadly speaking. Um, and so that that year, kind of inspired by what had happened within the Catholic Church, they pass a resolution on the importance of sexual integrity for clergy who were to be, quote, above reproach morally. Um, they also urged churches to, quote, discipline those guilty of any sexual abuse in obedience to Matthew 18, 6, 17. I'm not great at reading the numbers of Bible verses, but that verse reads, quote, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If you still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, again, (laughs) There's a pagan a, uh, yeah, or a tax collector. Yeah, what man. Happened? Fucking Wait, how do they the treat Bible pagans classic tax libertarian collectors? rant. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's one of those verses that like if you're the kind of guy who makes your own license plates and then shoots at police during traffic stops. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, you're yeah, a yeah. big fan of that one. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> um, but no, you can obviously, again, like everything in the Bible, there's a reasonable interpretation of that, which is the Christian church is essentially this like radical social movement uh, that doesn't want to be torn apart by like petty disputes. So it's saying like, hey, if you've got like, if if someone does something kind of fucked up, first talk to them one-on-one and try to get them to see that they like did something that was like hurtful or negative. And if that doesn't help, bring other people along and try to, you know, you gradually get to the point where a group Intervention is and then you don't you start there. You give people there. the opportunity. Yeah, exactly. And if they don't listen, then you, you know, then maybe they need to be out and stuff, right? Not okay, an unreasonable- Okay, but unreason- what if that person's a rapist in this? Yes, exactly. Offender? And I, this it's, I, I don't know. The Bible verse is probably talking about like, yeah, what if a guy doesn't want to share his fish? You know? Exactly. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like, right. Not, yeah. 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 They weren't talking like, what if a guy is systematically molesting women as part of a network of churches well, that include yeah. more people Eventually, than existed on Eventually treat them like a tax then. collector. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, what if, so, what yeah. if I want something worse for this person yeah. than yeah. how I treat a tax collector? Yeah, exactly. Um, now, again, there's a number of ways you can interpret this. Southern Baptist leaders tended to take it to mean if a, some if a if a pastor or someone else who is affiliated with us molests somebody, give them another chance, move them, give them another chance, mm-hmm. and you give them another chance, and then give them another chance. Somebody. You give them another yeah, chance. Move you know? It's cop shit, move right? It's yeah, like, it's, yeah, it's right. cop it's shit. Gonna... It's also, I mean, it's cop shit and it's Catholic pre shit, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. okay, well, we'll just move you to another place, and then uh, with people more opportunities, will, where, where it happened, just... they'll forget about it, and you go exactly. to another place, and then it happens. And let's you know. t- let's yeah. just put you around people who don't know who you are. Exactly. exactly. Let's remove you from the community that now has some immunity to you because they're aware of that you're a creep, and let's mm-hmm. put you in a new place. Yeah. It's good cool. stuff. Good stuff. And good, Cody. Cool and, and good. good. Yeah. Yeah. In 2003, popular Illinois pastor Leslie Mason was caught molesting four young girls. State leaders told him he would be fired and lose severance pay if he did not resign. Interesting that they gave a shit about that. I would say fire his ass because he molested four girls. Yeah. But maybe I'm not a Christian. The you resigning, know, like maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe fire him from a cannon. I don't know. Mm. So he he gets convicted uh, and is sentenced to seven years in prison in a plea deal, which drops all but two of his charges. Uh, um, he gets, I mean, probably something messed up there, but whatever. He goes to prison. Uh, so he gets out after he does his time, and he goes right back to preach at a new SBC church, just classic. miles away from his old one. He becomes a rising star within the church again, traveling around the state and preaching until his past charges are publicized by a writer with the local Baptist newspaper. And again, you could see this as a success for the fact that the Southern Baptists have set up their own media arm, right? This is a member of the community who has exposed this guy, right? Which is dope, right? That's unequivocally a good thing. Good journalism. Good on you, buddy. But Mm. people don't react well to this. Angry readers deluge the newspaper and condemnation against the newspaper's expose pours in from the Illinois State Baptist Association. Uh. Director Glenn Aikens complains, quote, to have singled out Les in such a sensationalistic manner, Ignores many others who have done the same thing. You could have asked nearly. You could have. Oh wait! You could have asked nearly any staff member and gotten the names of several prominent churches where the same what? sort of sexual misconduct has occurred recently in our state. That's bad too. Okay. What the fuck? <laughs> Give me their fucking names, buddy. Dude, go do that. Because you can then go do that. Yeah. Then do that. Oh, my God. It's, it's like Derek Chauvin's lawyer being like, look, he was just doing what cops are trained to do when he murdered that man. It's like, yeah, do you not I see how that's that. worse? I'm <laughs> watching We Own This City, this HBO show about dirty uh, cops in Baltimore. And that's what it uh, is. It's like one after the other. Well, like, yeah, well, that guy's doing it. This mm-hmm. guy's like, yeah. It. This guy's man. That's it. that's why it's bad to be you. <laughs> like, yeah, right. Like, yeah. Do you not get it yet? <laughs> And yes, it's like when you're yeah. staring at something like, yes, that's the problem. This is yeah. the problem. You are a problem. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> so obviously, uh, abuse by church officials did not start in the early 2000s, right? I'm sure this no, has been going on as no, long as there's been Southern Baptists. <laughs> uh, but under the reign of Patterson and Pressler and their acolytes, deliberately hiding and supporting the rehabilitation of pastors who assaulted children becomes basically official policy. 
Debbie Vasquez was molested at age 14 by her pastor in Sanger, Texas, back in the late 1970s. She was assaulted several times before being impregnated by a married pastor more than a dozen years older than her. For years, she kept the secret. But then, in the early 2000s, while the conservatives tightened their grip on the Southern Baptist Convention, stories like Mason's began to filter out. She decided it was time to take a tremendous risk and try to do something. And I'm going to quote next from an investigation published by the Houston Chronicle and the San Antonio Express News. I think I said just the Chronicle earlier. It's a a joint kind of big investigation between the Houston Chronicle and the San Antonio Express News that honestly deserves a fucking Pulitzer. Quote, In June 2008, she paid her way to Indianapolis, where she and others asked leaders of the Southern Baptist Convention and its 47,000 churches to track sexual predators and take action against congregations that harbored or concealed abusers. Vasquez, by then in her 40s, implored them to consider prevention uh, policies like those adopted by faiths that include the Catholic Church. Listen to what God has to say, she said, according to audio of the meeting, which she recorded. All that evil needs is for good to do nothing. Please help me and others that will be hurt. Days later, Southern Baptist leaders rejected nearly every proposed reform. (laughs) Now, in the years that followed, that's uh, 2008. 2008. In the years that follow, more than 250. Yeah, thanks, Obama. Unbelievable. Um, More than 250 Southern Baptist pastors, leaders, and volunteers would molest or sexually assault children and other members of their congregation. More than 700 victims have come forward to date in total. Many would do it more than once in multiple churches, and we'll tell that story, and we'll also tell some stuff that's less depressing in part two. Oh, I can't wait. Uh, Mm -hmm. Part of that I look forward to. Yeah, aspects of that will be very cathartic. Others won't. Others sure won't. Katie and Cody, um, you, you got any? Uh, you got any plugs for us at the end here? Oh boy, we oh sure do. Boy, you can check out our other shows. Some more YouTube news channel. is available yeah. on YouTube and where you get podcasts. Even more news is available where you get the podcasts. And our tweet tweets are online. <laughs> our tweets are on, your tweets. Where are you online. go to get the tweets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at, at the tweet store. Yeah, Patreon. Yeah. I should invest more time in my other Patreon social media. Some more news. You Patreon. should not. Uh-huh. Uh, no, we should all like... get one TikTok together. <laughs> yes, that's kind of what I was getting at. I'm actually, I mm-hmm. actually think maybe we should, and we should talk we could about get a TikTok. that. We could have we some real fun in it. that in that environment. Mm-hmm. Just we could like dab. How are you guys talking off. about? We could dab. The kids kids Just, are dabbing a lot these. Six are years th- ago. These, I was gonna say. Like, what <laughs> I think. I think that what the kids want are more of us. Man. You know. Yeah. Paul oh, Ryan. The kids love us. Fucking like. Yeah. 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 The kids haven't let's caught make, on. Guys. To, let's what? do. So I'm sorry, Katie. I cut you off. No, no, I wasn't going anywhere oh. good. <laughs> well, I was just gonna say that we should make our TikTok be Paul Ryan themed. Just Ooh, like bring fun. him back, you know? Yeah. Like bring go, back go hardcore. Paul Ryan. <laughs> bring, bring Do you back. think that, yeah. that will yeah. hit with the teens? Yeah, big Paul yeah Ryan I think the teens are the teens are ready for a bright vice presidential candidate well, who does cross. They it. weren't ready before, which is why they sure he well, lost. Well, they were too young. They were yeah, too young. Exactly. But now they're the perfect age to see that picture yeah. of him in the working out. You know that post. Oh workout. yeah. Oh so, right. yeah. Oh yeah. I think I speak for everyone when I say we've all suffered enough. We do not. I mean, it would that. be fun. Oh, we you can know suffer what, more that, though. That we picture of Paul could. Ryan. Good. What we could do with it because it's a it's a piece of that picture. Of Paul Ryan is a piece of one of my favorite kinds of content, which is official Republican com- Party communiques attempting yeah. to like get people yeah. horny. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like yeah, a, yeah. it's like a species of Republican yeah. Party propaganda, do and it's include, so embarrassing every time. Do you include Don Jr.'s hunting photo as part of that? Oh, for sure. They're, yeah, they yeah, were yeah. they did it's their best. So they did their best. Mm-hmm. Um, so embarrassing. My failed. God, it's so funny. It's never well, not a, funny. This was a fun yeah. and uplifting note to end this episode mm-hmm. on. So yeah, go, go yeah. to yeah. Him yeah, check out our Paul us. Ryan yeah. TikTok where yeah, we go coming at ya. Yeah, use one of those AI bots to make. Uncomfortable erotic videos of Paul Ryan filleting himself with a bullwhip while standing on top of a mm. Dodge Dart. With that, yeah, oh no, that. oh no song going in the background. Oh yeah, my that's God. right. Do it. Oh no. Yeah. Oh no. God. No, that one. Man. I don't need to sing it. You know it. Mm-hmm. And, and we're done. Episode? Oh, we're, we're done. done. Yeah, we're done.
Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com, or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.